Hi, this is Eric Messerschmidt, DP on Mank, and you're listening to The Go Creative Show. Hey, everyone. My name is Ben Consoli. I am a director and owner of BC Media Productions, and this is The Go Creative Show, a podcast for filmmakers. I am so excited for this episode today because we've got Eric Messerschmidt back on the Go Creative Show, talking all about his new film, Mank, directed by David Fincher. Of course, it tells the story of Herman J. Mankiewicz, the writer of Citizen Kane. And it's shot in black and white, true black and white. And it uh, takes place in the 1930s and early 40s. And it's just such a unique looking film. The storytelling's different. The writing's different. The look is different. It just, it really does transport you to a different time. I was telling him in the show, and you'll hear it, it it's like, I don't watch it and think to myself that I'm watching a, you know, a 2020 movie uh, that takes place in the 30s. I really feel like I'm watching a movie that was shot in the 30s. It's a really interesting distinction. And I know you guys love this movie as well because we have a lot of audience questions and we ask a ton of them in this episode. So thank you guys so much for supporting us. And while we're talking about supporting the show, we are trying something new on Go Creative Show. We now have a Patreon. I'm really excited about this because, you know, we resisted it for a while because I wanted to do it right. I I wanted to create a Patreon and a way to kind of build a community around Go Creative Show that was authentic, that was real. And uh, together with my producer, Connor, we've kind of come up with an idea that we think you guys are going to like and a great way to kind of give some value to the support. So, I want you to go to gocreativeshow.com forward slash join and check out the Patreon, check out the different tiers. We're going to be offering a few different things here. Um, you know, certainly the the lowest price tier is going to get you some exclusive content that you don't hear on the show, and, and that will be great. Um, but the higher up you go, you get different things, uh, like any Patreon. But we're giving away exclusive content. We're also doing some voting power, exclusive voting power on future guests. So you guys really can help us shape the show. And um, also the ability to have your questions heard on the show um, by actually leaving voicemails. So you can have your actual voice on the show and, and really be a co-host of the show with me. And I'm really excited about that one. And of course, at the higher tier, you get executive producer credits, your name mentioned in the show. And we're going to be building out this Patreon as we go on and really figure out from you what you like, what you don't like, what you'd like to see in the Patreon. So this is a very fluid process for us. And we are just so excited to be able to offer something cool and different to our listeners and to the people out there that are really supporting us. So please, Check it out, gocreativeshow.com forward slash join to join our Patreon and show your support for Go Creative Show. And with that, let's dive right into our interview with the director of photography of Mank, Eric Messerschmidt. So I'm here with Eric Messerschmidt, ASC, the cinematographer and director of photography for Mank, and so happy to have you back, Eric are you basically trying to become a co-host on Go Creative Show? Because this is your third time in a year. <laughs> we should talk about that. Yeah, we should we should start to negotiate that deal, maybe, huh? <laughs> I mean, you have had a, such an insane year. It's just, it's like crazy, especially. Well, first of all, having a year in filmmaking in 2020 is nearly impossible anyway. Uh, and besides just all of that craziness, you've just had one after another after another, just giant projects coming out this year. I mean, this is incredible. How does it feel? I've, I'm, I'm very fortunate. You know, it's been it's been a great. Yeah, it's. I mean, the the year itself has been complicated, obviously, and full of surprises and and pain for a lot of people. And uh, but but it's um, yeah, it's been there's been some interesting and exciting stuff in my life for sure. So uh, I'm thankful for it. And Mank is certainly a big one. Your first feature film. I mean, talk about a milestone. When did you start working on it? I was, you know, I I was in Africa doing Raised by Wolves. And, um, and David called me out of the blue and he said, hey, we're going to do this movie. You want to do this movie? And I said, yeah, of course. Yeah, I want to do this movie. Uh, and he sent me the script. And I knew it was black and white. Uh, he, had, you know, he had expressed that, but I, I didn't, um, 
I didn't know much more about it really. And he, he sent me the script and I said, Oh, okay. Got it. Uh, I had obviously hadn't read it and I was, and so I read it in Africa and, um, and then we communicated back and forth while I was there, you know, sending images back and forth and ideas and stuff and just kind of talking broadly about what the movie was and what he wanted it to be. And, um, and then I got back to LA like the first of September of last year. And, uh, we immediately went to work. I mean, I was like, like I landed on a Sunday and Monday I was in the office. Um, and I was, and I, I had kind of a short prep actually on the movie because I was, you know, was coming from overseas. So, uh, I hit the ground running. There must've been a challenge having such a short prep for something so unique. I mean, first feature film completely in black and white, and working with David Fincher, I mean, there's a lot going into this and to have a short amount of prep time must have been incredibly stressful. No, not really, actually. I mean, it's there's there was a lot to figure out, but David had figured out a lot, uh, you know, already by the time we got there. He picked almost all the locations with Don Burt, the designer. Ah. Um, so, uh, he, you know, he had a really good idea of where he wanted to shoot and how we were going to break stuff up. We, we made some changes. There were some things we, you know, we adjusted after we, we scouted and, and after I came on board. But, um, but for the most part, you know, he had a lot of the movie kind of figured out by the time I got there. You know, the broad strokes of it, you know, where we were going to shoot, what, what sets we were going to build, which sets we were going to shoot on location, et cetera. So, um, you know, we were able to kind of immediately start camera testing and, uh, talking about lighting and, and references and what the film was and, and start talking about, uh, you know, how he was going to stage those scenes in those locations. So it was, it was compact, but, uh, but you know, I, I actually felt pretty good towards the end. I mean, I felt like we had a good idea of where we were going and what we were going to do. And, um, you know, David and I have a pretty good shorthand at this point. So, so we don't have to have really, really long conversations to figure out where we're going to go. We, you know, we can have, quite quick conversations to get there. So, um, you know, it was, it worked out. It was good. It was, it was, it was busy, <laughs> it's definitely busy, but, uh, but we got there. I can imagine Fabrizio Diaz on Instagram wanted to know what it's like working with David Fincher. And you've had quite an experience with him already on Mindhunter, certainly. And then now on make, um, and it sounds like, you know, you had said that he, he had a lot planned before you even started getting involved. So your prep didn't have to be as lengthy as normal. Is that normal working with David? Like, is he, is he so particular to the point where he's making a lot of the decisions that you otherwise would perhaps in other situations be part of? Does he make all those decisions early on? Well, every director is different. I, I mean, I, David is very prepared. Uh, he, he has really, you know, he, he has, he has a version in, of the film in his head, um, of, you know, where he wants to be and how he wants to cut it and, uh, what the, what the sequences are in, in, you know, in broad terms. And then as we get into the nitty gritty and we start to look at the locations and consider the staging and, and look at what the lights doing, you know, those conversations evolve, uh, you know, David doesn't need a lot of help figuring out what the movie is, you know? Yeah. Uh, and so there's, I guess there's a difference there. You know, David has a really good idea of what the movie is and what movie he wants to make. Um, and I would argue that the movie that we made is the movie that we set out to make. So, um, there isn't much exploration in that sense with him. I, I think, I mean, the exploration is much more detailed. So, you know, it's, it's, it's all in the kind of the the specifics of how we're going to address something within a specific place or how the scene's going to come together or whatever, you know, it's, it's, it's not the, it's, it's not the broad nation, you know, world building of, of some other, of some other filmmakers. Yeah. And now the, the movie's called make it's on Netflix now. And it, it, it's the story of screenwriter, screenwriter, Herman J. Mankiewicz, um, who was in the process of developing Orson Welles, Citizens Kane. So it sort of chronicles that moment in history. Um, how familiar were you with this story prior to this movie? Uh, I knew, I knew who Herman Mankiewicz was, um, from a, just, you know, his, his name recognition and his, you know, his family. And, you know, I had seen Ben Mankiewicz, you know, Ben Mankiewicz always presents at the ASC awards. I knew who he was and the lineage and all that, but I didn't know that much. And I knew that he had written Citizen Kane, uh, the details of that, uh, and certainly our movie's take on it, I, I did not know anything about. I didn't know anything about the Upton Sinclair, the gubernatorial election of 1934. Um, 
I didn't know that much about William Randolph Hearst with the exception of what I knew kind of from Citizen Kane uh, legend. And I knew very little about Marion Davies and all the bit players. I mean, I kind of, I knew who Ben Hecht was. I, you know, I obviously I knew who, who uh, Louis Mayer was. Uh, I did not know who Irving Thalberg was, even though there's, you know, he's very famous and, and, uh, you know, there's a, there's Academy Award named after him. So, you know, but I didn't, I didn't actually know who he was. Um, and then I didn't even realize that he, uh, he and Mayer were, were, um, were, were coworkers. Um, so all of that was new to me, but, um, you know, it's, it was, yeah, it, that's kind of the, you know, that was like the, this, that was a big part of the prep. I think at least the early prep when I, before I got to LA, I, you know, I, I got the, you know, I got the citizen Kane book and I got the uh, campaign of the century and I read up on what the history was and sort of, and I, I re re acclimated myself to what cinema of that time period looked like and what was going on socio, uh, you know, socially and, and politically in California. Cause that's, you know, huge part of what, what we're talking about in the film. Um, yeah. So yeah, I mean, there was, there was a, a, a research period that happened, you know? Absolutely. And I mean, the, the film, at least visually is certainly inspired by Citizen Kane, but it's also inspired by just that time period. You know what I mean? Like that, that early Hollywood thirties and forties time period. But I think what you guys did in Mank is, is really interesting because a lot of people, and there, there were a lot of projects and a lot of movies made in that time period or made to depict that time period, rather. I think you guys, there, there was something in the cinematography that made it feel not like I was watching a movie about the 30s and 40s, but I was watching a movie from the 30s and 40s. Like, it, it really <laughs> felt like I was watching an old movie. And I think that is the distinction between what you guys did with Mank and what you've seen and what we've all seen in, in you know, in other projects that take place in that time period. Sure. Thank you for saying that. I, I you know, I was conscious of the fact that, um, that black and white, I, I felt could very easily become a parody of itself. You know, it sort of, it runs the risk of, 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 um, drawing attention to itself. And it, you know, it's like, you want to lean in the direction, I think, of pastiche and not so much in the direction of parody. And, and I was concerned about that. Um, and, you know, I, we we were absolutely looking at Citizen Kane and there's, in, in, you know, there's certainly inspiration drawn from it and homage. Um, but the movie is very different from Citizen Kane visually because the locations are different. You know, we have stuff in the desert. We have stuff in the studio lots. We have stuff in the... Um, in the bungalow. And a lot of these are kind of bright places, you know, there, there are these, you know, citizen Kane's very cavernous and it's, it's, it's moody by be, be really dictated because of the locations, I think more than anything. Um, so I, I, I knew that I could, I could borrow certain things from that. And we talked about what we, what we thought we could reference and what was, what was relevant, but, but it was really the focus was like, well, we need to make our movie. You know, we have to like, and, and I was worried about it. And honestly, I was like, I don't want to, like, I cannot approach every shot from great. It's black and white. What can I do in black and white? It's like, I have to approach each shot in terms of what's going on in, uh, in the scene, what's going on in this, this scene, as a scene in relation to the, the overall context of the, of this part of the film and, and how does it fit into the puzzle of the rest of the film? You know, so it's, there was a constant dialogue in my head, which I guess every, every cinematographer has with, uh, with themselves, you know, when you're making a film, but, um, but it's, I certainly felt it on this movie and I was, uh, really trying to, to keep, keep a steady hand on the throttle, you know, cause you could be very, very stylized, you know, you can get incredibly stylized really quickly in black and white and it's, and it starts to be seductive and you're like, Oh, that was fun. Or let's do that. But then if you don't make it for the right reasons, it draws attention to itself and it pulls the audience out, I think quite quickly. And, then the audience feels like they are, to your point, like watching a movie about that era or, you know, a parody of that era as opposed to getting sucked into that world. What were some of those seductive moments for you? Like, were there paths that you were going down and you're looking at the frame and thinking to yourself, like, no, 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 this is, this is too much. I've gone too far. I need to scale this back. <laughs> like, did you find yourself in those moments sometimes? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, I think... And then, you know, it's like I would ping pong between I've gone too far and I haven't gone far enough. Yeah. And if there was actually more than anything, I think about the, the 
third of the way through the movie, I called Dave and I was like, Hey man, I, I, I am I, am I going far enough? Like, are people going to look at this and wish, you know, they're like, well, what happened to citizen Kane? I thought you guys were going to make citizen Kane and you didn't make citizen Kane. And he was like, no man, well, no, you're doing fine. Just keep doing what you're doing. This is appropriate for the story. And you know, don't, don't overthink it. And, you know, we didn't talk a lot, in all honesty, about what we were going to do. We sort of like talk, David and I generally talk about what the logistical complications of the scene are and how we're going to tell the story and where we're, you know, what we want the background to be. And, we, you know, the, the kind of, I had sent him some images of what the film, you know, references I thought were appropriate and movies that I thought were interesting to look at. And, and he commented back, yeah, like, you know, I think this is interesting or maybe not this. And, you know, that's sort of how we, how we filtered it down, I guess, but we didn't really, it wasn't like we had exhaustive conversations about it all. You know, we just kind of did it. <laughs> yeah. Let's talk about how you developed that black and white look for Mank, because this is clearly more than just shooting in color and desaturating. There's, there's a lot more to this. And I'd like to kind of get into maybe even a little bit of the weeds as to how you got to ultimately that, look that's so authentic to the time period it really is stunning oh thank you well you know um there's a lot of stuff going on i guess i mean we the first thing we kind of did is we looked at the camera we were like okay what's our cam? what 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 are our camera options and i i was suspicious i i actually thought that we may we may it may turn out to be valuable to shoot in color hmm and desaturated, like you said, you know, and, and I had talked to Faden Papa Michael about his experience doing Nebraska and he had done that extensively. He had like shot in color and then they used the color in the DI and they graded it using the color and made it black and white and it gave him a lot of flexibility and it sounded great. And, you know, it really worked for him. And I mentioned that to David and David was like, yeah, that's interesting. We should explore that. So we shot some tests with a color camera and then we shot some tests with the black and white camera, which is which is a true black and white camera. You only get black and white out of it. What was the camera? Which is a, it was a red monochrome it's called. And so they take the sensor and they strip the, the bear pattern off the sensor and you just get luminance out of it. So it just results in a black and white image. Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, Aerie has a camera like that. Leica makes a still camera, a monochrome still camera, which is very popular with, with hobbyists and still photographers. And, you know, it's, it's not a new idea. Red has been making a camera like that, not this particular model, but they made a, a 6k black and white camera for many years, um, as well. Um, which I had shot a little bit of, and I, I was familiar with. So, you know, I was, that, that was a seductive idea. You know, it's like, okay, cool. We get, we could do black and white for black and white. Like that's, that's cool. Nobody yeah. really does that anymore, you know? Um, so we shot that against the color and then we went to the, the theater and we screened the footage of the test and we looked at each other and we're like, okay, well, that's what we're going to do. We're not going to shoot the color camera. Like it's so much better. And it had a lot of, you know, it had this kind of depth and, tonal range uh, and um kind of creaminess that we just you just did not get and the, the color camera looked very dull and and even when we tried to grade it and get some bite out of it and get some it just had it did not compare it wasn't even close hmm. um i mean we were quite quite taken actually because i i don't think either of us had seen the difference you know, in a, in a diptych before, like we had sort of, we had shot the camera and played with it and we're like, yeah, it looks good. And we had shot some black and white and you desaturate. It was like, yeah, it looks good. And then you saw them next to each other and it was like, holy shit, that's amazing. Like we got to do this. Yeah. Um, it had this kind of platinum print or silver gel, you know, it's gelatin print kind of depth to it that was, it's hard to describe, but, um, you know, um, uh, so we, we started there and then I did a whole series of lens tests and we looked at, a, you know, a lot of lenses. And one of the things that we definitely wanted to borrow from Citizen Kane um, was deep focus photography and, you know, shooting at very deep f-stops. So I did some extensive lens testing and uh, looked at a variety of lenses and, and we settled back on the Leicas. Um, surprisingly, actually, was not our was not what we expected to do. Why didn't you expect that? Well, you know... The lenses, all lenses fall apart a little bit. They lose, they lose resolution as you close them down. Um, as you get, as you get towards the end of the lens on, on the, on the, on the T-stop anyway, you get, you, you get this thing called diffraction where you start to, it almost looks like astigmatism. You get this kind of softness and, and 
you know, straight lines fall apart and you, you know, you get, um, blurry blurriness and spherical aberration and stuff. The lenses start to break basically. Um, and it's subtle, but you really see it. And, and so I had, I had suspected that the, the large format lenses actually like Primo seventies or the, uh, Supreme primes, um, may be better because they, we would use more of the meat of the glass when you close the iris down, you know, the lenses because they're built for the larger format. And it was just a hunch. Mm. So I went and I tested them against the Leicas and it, and it was true. They did, they did outperform the Leicas, um, in terms of resolution, but, but because they were larger format lenses, um, and this gets very esoteric, but the, the iris was physically larger than, than they were on the Leica. So that the apparent depth of field was less at the same stop. So for example, a T11 on the Primo 70 appeared to have less depth of field than, than, uh, than the Leica at an 11. Really? Uh, yeah. Because, because the of iris that larger, physically smaller. Uh, okay. Yeah. Huh. Which I, well, I had, I, which completely new to me, it was a completely new concept. And, um, we, you know, we learned a lot in that process, which is why you test, I guess, you know, so, so we ended up back on the Leicas, which was, which was nice because it was, you know, it was a set of lenses we knew quite well and we had shot Mind Hunter on them and, uh, we knew the focal lengths and, you know, it was, we could both David and I could quite comfortably sit in the corner of the room and know what a 25 was going to see or what a 29 was going to see. You know, it was like, we didn't need the finder really, you know, yeah. we kind of were like, okay, we'll put this lens on. Um, so that was kind of nice. And what F stops were you in for the most part? No, we were deep. We're like F 11. Wow. Uh, 16. Yeah. I mean, I, there's, there's sequences in the movie that are at an eight, but, but for the most part, eight and a half, 11. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That like, you just don't hear that. Right. <laughs> you really don't hear that right now. <laughs> no, you don't. Now, so, yeah. so what accommodations need to, needed to be made? I mean, obviously more light, but I mean, what was your lighting package like to account for the fact that you were in such deep F stops? Well, it's, you know, it's funny you say that because actually the monochrome camera is significantly faster. One of the ad value added benefits of stripping the color filters off the front of the sensor is that um, you get a stop and a half more speed out of the camera. Oh, so, um, so I, I could quite comfortably rate the camera at 3,200 ASA. Really? Um, yeah. Uh, which, which meant that I wasn't working at 500 foot candles. I was working at, you know, hundred foot candles, 150 foot candles or whatever. Um, so there was more light, I would say than normal on the set, but not, not nearly as much as if I had shot at 800 ASA or 640 ASA or whatever, if on a color camera and had to, had to shoot it at an 11, which was quite a daunting idea. You know, when we were in the prep, it's just so much more light than we're used to working with, um, uh, you know, back to the film days in a way, obviously, but it, you know, it's interesting because it does change the way you light and it changes the way you work. Yeah, like what are some of those changes? We've got a question actually on YouTube from, and I hope I'm saying this right, Lucia Fecky Tova um, wants to know, is lighting black and white images easier or harder than colored? I, I'd like to know that. And I'd also kind of like to know, you know, what types of sources you were using to really sure. replicate that 30s and early 40s look. Uh, it's not easier or harder. It's just a different set of choices. You know, it's like, it's like, that's, you know, it's sort of like saying, is it easier to play jazz than it is to play classical guitar? You know, sort of, it's like a totally different thing. Um, uh, you know, you make different choices. I, I think, I think for me, it was, it was, I was employing a technique that I hadn't used much, uh, recently, you know, it's, it's become very much in vogue in, in modern cinematography to work at, you know, five foot candles and work with a lot of soft light and um and and with very shallow focus and use a lot of color separation and, and um and this kind of very soft you know underlit look is in kind of in fashion right now and um you know i had been doing a lot of that work actually you know certainly this kind of low-key style of lighting and um I had to go back to my roots a little bit in my days uh you know as a as a younger man as a gaffer, you know, lighting film and, and thinking about kind of more deliberate light sources and harder light sources. And so, yeah, we used Fresnel's, you know, big incandescent Fresnel's T12s, 20 Ks, you know, and, and some soft light as well, but, but it was, you know, it was a lot of hard light. And certainly in the, in the flashback sequences, there's more hard light than there is in the bungalow stuff. That stuff's a little bit more modern light, actually. It's got a kind of 
um, a slightly more contemporary look to it, I think, you know, with more practical stuff. Yeah, and there's almost like a bloom in the highlights. Well, there's, there is a bloom in the highlights, in the bungalow especially, and some of the flashbacks too, but there's there's this kind of like, it's it's so soft and so blown out, it's almost just like pure white in some of the, in some of like behind the windows or behind the doorways sometimes yeah. in the bungalow. Well, you, we, we, you know, we, uh, we used a lot of smoke. And I don't, I don't generally, and I certainly didn't on Mank, but I don't generally like a lot of diffusion on the lens. Mm. Um, I just don't, I find it, it's hard to make it look real. And, and I would much prefer to use atmosphere in the set. So um, we used atmosphere and that, you know, see so those, those, the glow around the windows is essentially it's lit smoke in those wow. situations. Um, but then, you know, we did another thing where we, in the DI, we, we, we bloomed the blacks so we keyed the blacks and grabbed them and defocus them a little bit. And, um, it's kind of an old trick, but it, it's, it's, it's meant to reference a thing that happens in black and white release stocks. When you dupe them multiple times, you get this kind of blurriness and softness in the blacks. And it's, it's part of how we got that kind of pearlescent quality in, in the image. Uh, so it's a, you know, it's a combination of things going on. One of the things that I noticed too, is the dissolves, are very unique looking. You use dissolves quite a bit, but it almost, it, it appears as though you have like layers of the shot and they're dissolving independently of each other is almost what it looks like. I don't even know what to call it. I don't know if it's an old film yeah, technique exactly or what, right. but, it, but it's a very unique looking dissolve. Could you talk to us about that and where that came sure. from? Well, you know, it's actually, it's actually not a dissolve. It's a lighting cue. It's a theatrical thing cue, yeah, which is how we do that. And that's a thing that, that Wells had done in Kane, by the way. So it's a, we're, we're, we're tipping our hat a bit to him there. But it's, uh, it, you know, we use it in the movie as a, as a way to flash back in time. So, you know, David was interesting in, interested in exploring different ways to explain to the audience when we were, when we were moving around in time, because the movie, like Kane, uh, is is non-linear in its storytelling you know it jumps back in time and then it jumps forward and then you go to 1934 and then you're in 1939 and you're sort of you know you're moving back and forth all the time and um and he thought well what, let's have one constant to make sure that the audience understands when we're going backward and and uh, the thing we chose was this theatrical lighting cue um and which is fun because you can sort of decide which part of the frame you want to stay, want to linger you know the kind of latent image aspect to it uh so I don't know. I don't remember how many times we did it. Five or six times, I think, in the film. But uh, yeah, I'm glad you noticed that. That's cool. It's really effective because I guess dissolve wasn't even the right term because you're not going to anything else. It's like a fade to black almost. And um, yeah, it, it, it but it, it's just done in such a unique way. And it's one of the things that popped out to me a lot. And it's, you know, when like reading all the articles about Mank and your work on it, I was so surprised one after another, after another, I'm like, how could this not be brought up? Am I the only maniac that's noticing how cool <laughs> these fade to blacks are? <laughs> it's cool. No, thanks. I'm glad it's, it's great. It's great to hear people notice that, you know, we've got a question here from Oscar Garcia on YouTube. And I think it's a great one. He wants to know, how did you get the look of the thirties without losing quality in the digital HD capture? I know it's not HD, but uh, I think the essence of this is kind of like, how do you create that look without losing quality in the recording? Um, could you talk to us about the way that you kind of took clearly, a, what was it, an AK image mm -hmm. that you were capturing? What were you doing to that AK image um, to kind of bring it down to the 30s kind of look? Well, we always knew we were going to oversample. You know, it was an obvious, it, you know, AK is part of that. Um, we pushed the camera a little bit beyond its comfort zone. It, it, you know, for, that was the first thing we did. The, the camera probably is, should be, you know, if you were going to be clinical about it, should be shot more around 1600 ASA. It's, it's much cleaner. It's a much cleaner image there. Uh, at 3200, it starts to break up a little bit. You get a little bit of noise in the shadows and, it, and you get some dithering in the highlights and it looks, you know, quite a bit like film grain actually. Uh, so we started there and that, um, that kind of screwed the image up a little bit. And then, you know, we knew we would, we would step all over it afterwards. So we, you know, we added some dust and scratches and we added additional grain depending on, on, on the scene and the lighting, you know, and contextual with other shots. And there's some gate weave that's done in post. 
and there's a little bit of distortion in places and you know so there's there's all that kind of digital trickery that we're doing to 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 manipulate the image but it's we are screwing it up i mean it's not a you know it's you're looking at a 4k image when you look at it on netflix on a 4k television you're looking at a 4k image but we have stepped all over it. i mean we've done you know everything except to drag it, you know, drag the negative out in the parking lot, you know, but, uh, yeah. but it, yeah, I mean, that's the idea to, 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 um, to degrade it, I suppose you could say. Yeah. There's degree. those, um, I, 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 and I could be totally wrong, but I, I want to say they're like markers to change the reels, like the, in the uh-huh. old film days, like the, these little uh-huh. circles and artifacts, those were brought in. Um, yeah. I, it just lends itself. And you guys just did like, that's such a risky thing to do because it could come across so cheesy if it's not done right. And I just yeah. feel like it never felt that way. It always, like I said, it always felt like I was actually watching an old movie and not, you know, a 2020 interpretation of an old movie. And uh, I, that sure. That that's is just, good. that's a difficult thing to do. I can imagine, I mean, that would be something I'd be thinking about the whole time. Like, are we overdoing it? Are we pushing too hard Is would be my uh, fear. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, I mean, I certainly was. I mean, I had you know the the real change marker specifically. That's all. That's David Fincher, you know, and, and no one does that better than David Fincher, I think. But um, but yeah, I think both of us, while we were making the movie, were looking at it and trying to be like, well, can we can we do this? You know, what's going to happen? And you know, I guess you, you just kind of you, you roll the dice with any project and you hope that it's going to work. And you know, hopefully people enjoy it and they get something out of it. But it, it's uh, yeah, I mean, we were constantly kind of riding the line, you know, and, and there's also, I think in the film, you know, there's elements of noir, there's elements of glamor, there's sort of, you know, there's elements of naturalism and realism. And, and the movie is, is borrowing from that entire spectrum of, of cinema. And, uh, you, you hope when you're making those choices that they're, that they're right. And it's, you know, most of them are situational within the context of the scene. And, you know, Mank is not a noir film, really. It's not a glamour film, really. It's, it's not a, it's not a caper. It's not a whodunit. It's not, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's not, you know, there's no Philip Marlowe character, uh, you know, in, in the film, but there's, um, you know, there's pieces of it. There's, there's sort of, you know, the sinister kind of, aspects to the Thalberg office, you know, could, you know, I felt like those could be very classical and they could be very kind of, you know, early forties, you know, borderline noir look, you know, the day interior with the Venetian blinds and stuff itself. It just felt like that was right for that scene. But, you know, there are other scenes where you, you know, couldn't do that. It didn't feel like the bungalow would be appropriate there. That The bungalow to me felt like it needed to be very soft lit and sort of natural and, and contemporary. And, you know, it's, the bungalow is probably much is about as close as we get to Manhattan, you know, in terms of like borrowing from that as an aesthetic more so than grapes of wrath or Casablanca or whatever, you know? Yeah. Um, so we're, you know, we're moving, we're jumping around a bit in the movie, I guess uh, is what I'm saying it, from in terms of references. So it's because the movie doesn't really reside in one place. There's another question actually from um, Lucia um, Fecky Teova. I'm sorry if I'm saying it wrong, but this person wants to know if you considered at all shooting on film for this. Was that ever a consideration? No, no, Why? not really. We we talked about it. Well, you know, it's just I think um, film is film is wonderful. It's a lovely format to work in, um, but it dictates a lot of the onset workflow. And uh, so we looked at film we looked at the results of film and the things we loved about film. I mean, but one of the things, you know, David in particular doesn't like about film is, uh, the unhappy accidents that Mm. you get, the unexpected things that happen. And, you know, a lot of us like to say, Oh, well, but we love to embrace the happy accidents. And there's something to be said for that, I think. But, um, for every, every surprise in my experience, there's 10 disappointments, you know? Yeah. And for someone who's very exacting as a director for David and someone who wants to art direct the frame and, you know, look on, look on a monitor and, 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 uh, you know, consider where the, where the pencil jar needs to be, you know, within, within millimeters and really sort of orchestrate the entire thing. Um, you know, that, that's, that's not a particular shooting on film is not a particularly, uh, easy format to work in if you're going to be that particular about those things, those sorts of things, you know, you, 
you have to look through the eyepiece and you're looking at on a ground glass and you're trying to judge focus and you're, you know, it's, it's a very different onset workflow. So, you know, we felt like we could get where we wanted to get, uh, shooting digitally and we could apply the techniques we wanted to do and we could art direct them. So we could play with film grain instead of dealing with film, film grain photochemically, we could, uh, we could light it with a hundred foot candles instead of lighting it with 600 foot candles. We could, um, we could adjust the gate weave to taste instead of accepting the gate weave that's going to be in the movement. You know, so there were like, there were, you know, there were things that we wanted to art direct essentially that those aspects of the, you know, the, the film experience we wanted to actually art direct and, and, and adjust. Um, and so, you know, you, does the movie look like it was shot on film? I don't know. It's debatable. The, does the movie look the way we wanted it to? Absolutely. You know, it's like it, there were there were no surprises involved in the process of, of, of how we arrived at, at the way the movie looks. It's entirely um, based on testing and, and deliberate results of, just, of decisions that we were going to make. Uh, so I don't Does that answer the question, you think? It, it, yeah. It, and you've mentioned something a couple of times now, and I th- it's just me not knowing the term. Are you saying gate weave? Gate weave. Yeah. Gate what weave is, is that? Thing that happens. I, I haven't so, heard. I've so, never heard that before. Okay. So yeah. So in a, in a, in a projector in particular, it happens in a, in a optical printer. Um, it happens in poorly made camera movements, but you know, there's a, there's a pull down claw and then there's a registration pin and some movements have four registration pins. Some have, I mean, the IMAX I think has eight or six or something. I can't remember, but they're, uh, most 35 millimeter cameras have two registration pins and two pull down cloth. So they pulls, it pulls the film into, into place and the registration pins go on the top and they hold the, the, the negative there static for the 50th of a second. And then it exposes the frame and does the next thing. Right. And that's the process that happens. And the same thing happens in the projector. Well, as the, as the, as the print goes through the projector, those, those registration pins start to wear away at the, at the purse. Hmm. a little bit. Uh, and so they don't register as cleanly in the fifth viewing as they do in the first viewing. That's the first thing that happens. The other thing that happens is the the pins are not always perfectly sized. So there's a little bit of play in the negative. So, the you know, and the gate is the part of the, of either the projector or the camera where the, where the frame the Academy frame is where it gets exposed and then where it gets projected. So gate weave is the film just ever so slightly moving around. And so you get this and you see it, you know, and particularly in, in poor quality transfers of period films that, you know, that, that maybe don't exist on the best, um, you know, the, the best prints, um, you get this very kind of thing that happens. So we were, we were, we were doing that. So you're adding that, in post afterwards, just to kind of give it that film artifact, exactly. like we were yeah. talking about. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Now you may have answered this question earlier, but Pascal uh, Monthovent on YouTube wanted to know about diffusion filters. It's he says um, you seem to have used them. It, you seem to have used various filters. Could you tell us which one? Which is probably not going to happen. And did you also add any glow at the color grading stage? So. Sounds like you didn't really like to use filtration on your lens, as far as diffusion goes. You went for atmosphere no, instead, I didn't but use diffusion. No, yeah, I used atmosphere. I did use um, I did use a, a Harrison Orange too. Okay, I'll I'll, I'll tell you. All right, good. No well, secrets. some people are very some people are very you know they hold it close to their to their vest. No, I don't care about that. It's like it's a totally recipe. Fine. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, I used a I used a Harrison Orange too. Um, which is a color filter and color filters are common in, in black and white photography. And you use them to, to, to for various effects. You can use them to adjust contrast. Um, uh, you can use them to, to exaggerate the density of certain parts of the frame, you know, like red filters, for example, are really good for saturating blue skies. Um, uh, but they have other, they have of other effects as well. Some, sometimes they're not desirable. Um, the orange filter is sort of a good general filter. And, and part of the thing it does is it, it helps with the, the diffraction artifact I was talking about because the diffraction, there's more diffraction happens in the blue wavelength than it does in the, in the red wavelength because uh, the blue is the shorter wavelength. So it, it scatters more quickly in the iris. So you put the orange filter on and it reduces the amount of blue in the sensor and therefore the diffraction. Um, huh. It also does some beneficial, bene, beneficial things for skin tones. It sort of 
um, evens out blemishes. And, you know, if you have a face like mine with a lot of freckles on it, the freckles sort of start to disappear in the skin is, you know, because the orange filter kind of helps even that out. Um, and, and that it helps with, with, uh, uh, with complexion. Um, and, uh, and no, I didn't, I didn't add any glow in post. I mean, it's Amanda Safer just actually looks like that. So it's like, <laughs> uh, you know, um, yeah, it's remarkable, you know? So it's, um, uh, uh, I didn't, you know, I didn't do anything. And we did do, do that black bloom effect, but we didn't really bloom any highlights. I mean, we would certainly lift areas and there's some, you know, there's some grading of course of, of adjusting contrast and windows and grabbing a little bit more you know, exposure here and pushing that stuff down. And, um, uh, and, you know, and there's always the, you know, the occasional blemish fix or, or paint out or clean up or, or whatever. But, um, you know, that's pretty, that's pretty, um, ubiquitous in cinema these days anyway. But, uh, but no, there aren't any, I wouldn't say there are any, uh, you know, excessive, uh, tricks being played. We did, we did do some paint on flares. There's quite a bit of painted on flares in the movie. And, that was something we had done a lot of on Mindhunter and, and loved doing. Uh, and, uh, you know, the one thing about the Leica is, is you shoot lenses that good. It's very, very, very difficult to get them to flare. Mm. So, and certainly difficult to get them to flare the way we wanted them to flare. Uh, you know, we wanted this very kind of vintage lens kind of feel is, you know, the bell and howl and a crazy, you know, ring flares was something we really wanted. And we were, you know, so, so those, uh, most of the flares in the movie are, are, have been added, um, which is a process I just adore because you can get in there in the nitty gritty and be like, can this be a little bit bigger? Or can this be brighter? Or what if this was, instead of glowing, can this be striated and starred? Because we should be, because we're, you know, we're close the iris down and you, when you close the iris, you get these very cool kind of star filters and, 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 you know, sunburst kind of looks and stuff. So, um, that that is such a fun process. I love I love participating in that part of it. Yeah, the flares in this are so cool. I'm glad you brought that up because yeah. they're really unique and they're like full circle flares on lights, yeah. and it's just very very cool. Thank you, thank you. We got a question from uh, Sri Harsha on YouTube. When it comes to camera placement uh, and the philosophy behind coverage, are there any basic guidelines? Um, now, this is something that we've been asked by our audience quite a bit. Uh, people want to know about cinematographers' philosophy on coverage and how you kind of approach it. And um, can you talk to us about that for Mank? And then maybe just kind of in general, do you have like a certain set of, you know, basic guidelines for your own projects? Well, coverage design and sequencing and shot selection stuff, that's by far my favorite part of the job. Mm. And I think that's where you connect most with the director, obviously, and you're, you know, you're sitting with the director and figuring out how you're going to break the scene apart and which pieces you're going to cover as one and which pieces you need close-ups are, you know. And I, that's where I think cinematography has most most to do with editing, actually. Yeah. And, and, you know, I think I think in a lot of ways, cinematography has more to do with editing than it has to do with photography. Um, you know, there's... You, you know, you, we, we really are, are, it's at the beginning process of how, how the story gets told is, you know, those, those choices that are made. Um, I mean, for me personally, I generally think at least in the classical kind of filmmaking I've been doing with David, you know, we are generally pretty dogmatic with screen direction and, and considerate of the, the line. And, you know, we don't cross the line that often and we're really sort of, we're looking for strategic places in the scene to make the, that, that line cross. And, you know, you have these elaborate dialogue scenes where people are talking to each other and then this person is over here and now that person has to, you know, so that they're on the other side of the triangle and it's, you know, it becomes this kind of elaborate geometry puzzle. And, and you, you know, you have to think about the way the scene is going to be cut. So you make sure you're on the right side for this piece. And, um, but that's not to say that, you know, you can't cross the line or you, you know, that that's a, that's a rule, uh, excuse me. But, um, but I, I think, you know, at least with the work we've done and certainly on Mank, we were, we were quite particular about when we made those changes. And, and, you know, we were also, uh, you know, at least on Mank, we shot overs, but there's a lot of clean singles and there's, you know, there's a lot of sort of wide shots and it's sort of, it's a little bit more classical, I think in that way. It's, you know, there's certainly overs in some of the dialogue scenes and stuff, but, um, uh, but it's a lot of, you know, sort of clean two shots and, and clean medium singles on Mank and, 
And over you know, you're talking like over, you're talking over the over shoulders. shoulders. Yeah. 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 Did yeah. you did you follow kind of like that standard get your wide establishing shot first, work out performance and then go in for the tights or closer up shots that generally yeah, I would say generally. I mean there's sequences in the movie like for example the 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 San Simeon scene where we meet Marion the first time there isn't yeah. really a master. You know, that's and that's quite an elaborate scene and we shot that a bit out of order because the uh, we had to we had to plan it around the sun position, so that you know there's a lot of kind of pre visualization that was happening with that with that scene, and we went and we re- we rehearsed it well in advance with Charles and Arliss and and Gary and and Amanda, and so it, you know it took a lot of there's a lot of thinking about that, but but it was because we had rehearsed it well in advance and we sort of knew where the beats were and how we were going to cover it. The you know the the dinner table scene and the um, and the uh, mayor's birthday party scene in the parlor. Those were, um, those we, we definitely follow that rule of let's get the wide shot. Let's, you know, let's get into the performance, let everyone get loose, figure out what this, you know, really kind of commit to the, to the blocking. And then we went in and cut it apart. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's situational, but I think that's, I would say that 95% of the time, that's how we work. It's certainly in dialogue scenes. Do you think that there's an advantage for you coming from such a strong background in, you know, shooting for TV and those types of schedules, those types of budgets? Do you think there's an advantage for you going into feature film that, you know, generally has more budget and more time where you're a little bit more conservative with the way you spend time planning your shots? I mean, I think I think television is a great school to you know, it's a, it's a great place to experiment. It's a great place to, I mean, I think the best part about television is you get to work with a lot of directors mm. and you get to see a lot of directors make different choices and, and you get used to supporting different personalities. Um, uh, you know, I mean, you're, you, cinematographers always have to work quickly. It doesn't really matter what budget you're on. You're like always under pressure. And, and it's generally my experience, like the bigger movies, um, I've, I've worked on, uh, it's the, like the, expectations are bigger and the resources may be bigger, but it's, uh, and you might have a little bit more time, but you're doing something in, in many cases more complex than you would do on a, uh, on a television show. So there's, uh, you know, and certainly in the case of Mindhunter, we, you know, we, we had the resources to do it right. So I never felt like we were making creative compromise. I mean, you're making creative compromises every, you know, when you wake up in the morning, but well, it's but not it that it, like it's we, not that it's a compromise, we, but I think it's like time allocation. You're not just shooting yeah. just extra stuff to to get it. You're not just spraying down a room. Every shot is kind of thoughtful. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. I mean, certainly my work with David has been that way. I mean, I think there is a you know, look, there there is a there's a part of television and it happens in features too, I think, of of uh, well, the B camera is just getting something. Just go get a shot. So if we have to cut away, we have something and, you know, we'll focus on the A camera, but, you know, put a zoom lens on the B camera and, and, and fish or, or, or you get, you know, third camera, maybe throw it in the middle of the set. Maybe they'll get something and tell the operator to find shots and create develop shots. And that's never been the way I've worked with David. We always, we block for two cameras or block for three, three cameras and get purposeful shots. And we're actually checking, checking things off the list of pieces of coverage we want to do. And, um, and this movie was the same way, you know, we, we, did it for the, um, you know, the B camera was getting pieces we knew we needed and they were pieces we were going to rely on in the edit. You know, they, they were, these were shots we knew were going to be in the cut. So, um, you know, they, they got equal attention. There are some really iconic, well, soon to be iconic scenes in Mank that just really pop off the screen. I mean, that, First of all, the uh, the election party I think is a stunningly beautiful scene. Oh, you have you. you have the, all the dining hall dinner parties, all that kind of like of all the scenes that you worked on. I'd love to break down one or two of them and really get into maybe some of the challenges you overcame, lessons that you've learned, or just scenes that were particularly fun for you. I mean, what what can you point to as people watch this film and maybe go back to this scene? Uh, something you may want to break down for us here. No, thanks so much. I, uh, yeah, I mean the, the, I, the, the election party was really fun. I mean, there were, you know, there were, there were certain scenes in the movie where it felt appropriate for us to get a little bit more gestured with the light and get a little bit more stylized, you know? So that's certainly one of them where we felt like we could go a little further. And, um, 
and believe it or not, the 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 election night is is not lit very much. There isn't there there are not a lot of off camera sources being used in that scene. Really? Um, yeah, it's almost it's entirely lit with practicals, and and so we you know we had built these table lamps, and we had you know talked to Don Bird and 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 Jan Pascal the um, the uh, the uh, production the set decorator. Oh, okay. Uh, it was uh, she was the set decorator, and and, and Don was the um, Don was the uh, the production designer. And we built these lamps for the tables, and we put LEDs in them. You know, we made it possible so we could we could dim them up and down, and cue them off, and turn tables off that were off camera, so we could keep it dark in the foreground. And in that scene, you've got that big, huge um, nineteen. What is it? Nineteen thirty four. Nineteen thirty four. Nineteen thirty four sign. And just looking at that, I was like, oh my god, that e- there's so many bulbs on it. It seems so incredibly bright. I'm like, that has got to be a challenge to work with on set. Well, you know, it's that's that's part of that's part of why that that particular camera really shines is it it has an incredible dynamic range. Uh, we had tested it, you know, we we had tested Danny Gonzalez, the gaffer, brought like when we when we were shooting a camera test, he brought in like four boxes of light bulbs, and he's like, "What do you want to look at?" You know, and I was like, "Okay, well, and we won't look at all two hundred options. Like, let's narrow it down." You know, and um, he's great like that. He's like, "I got ideas. Like, we can look at this and this and this and this and." You know, we ended up finding, you know, the, the light bulb we settled on was like the most expensive one. It was of like course. this hand blown period glass, you know, uh, but it was period correct. Uh, but that was, you know, that sign in particular was something that Don Bird and I had been working on. We had been devising an idea to because we I, I want I knew that there was not a, a lot of there were, there would not be a lot of opportunities to relight shots to shots in, in that scene because there's a lot of coverage. We're moving all over the scene. It, it needed to feel moody. I, I would not have the opportunity to like, okay, we're now we're here. I got to move all these lights. And, you know, that was not going to fly with the schedule we had. So I had to think about ways to light it where I, I would actually get light as little as possible. And one of the, one of the solutions we came to was let's, let's build a, a, a sign or some sort of background on the stage that would can silhouette all these people. And so we, you know, we built the election, you know, the 1934 sign and then the, and then the sign that holds the, the election results. And, and that's doing 90% of the work in the scene, to be honest. I mean, there's a couple wow. source scores up there doing these kinds of shafts of light on the, on the, um, on the stage. And there's a follow spot on there and, and that's basically it. Uh, and the practicals and the sconces and stuff, you know? Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I you know we had so much fun with that, and it, it, you know a lot of it was just building depth and figuring out okay, move that table over and, and get this table so that that person is lit and then this person is lit, and we had some lights on the, up on the second story so we could give ourselves a little bit of backlight if we needed it, and you know when they're dancing on the on the dance floor, there's a little bit of light on on uh, on on Meg's wife there, so you know we we're certainly doing a little bit when we needed to, but for the most part, it's kind of practically lit actually. I've got to talk about the way you made that Hearst Castle exterior walk and talk scene come to life. That it just, it's for some reason that scene is the one that getting to that scene in the film is the one where I was like, I really feel like I've, I'm watching an old movie right now. Like that, for okay. some reason, that scene really drew me in and made me feel like they took a risk. With the black and white, they took a risk trying to recreate this time period, and it was a success. Like that—that that was the scene that was the turning point for me visually. Um, sure. Talk to me about that. I, I can tell it's one that you're proud of, and I'd love to know your thoughts about just kind of how you achieved it. Sure. I, I, we worked. Well, you know, that's so. That scene is day for night. I'm not sure if you knew that. No, I didn't know that. Yeah, it's day for night. Um, and it was a thing that. Uh that David brought up, well, you know, I had done some day for night on, um, on raised by wolves. And yeah, we and actually, I we, sent, I think we talked about that. Your, yeah, your day yeah, for night work and, on that. Yeah. Which, you know, was, was, was Ridley's idea and it wasn't mine, but it, you know, obviously it was Ridley and, and Darius Wolski had done that on the pilot. And then, you know, we got there and we saw it. I was like, okay, this is cool. This is interesting. I had never done it before. And I sent Fincher some frame grabs from the, from the 
TV show. And I was like, look at this, this is cool. And he was like, Oh, that's cool. Maybe we can do this on Mank." And, um, this, you know, the scene was important. We, you know, it's really important. The audience understand the scope of San Simeon and the, you know, the kind of extreme acreage that Hearst had. And that, you know, they're walking through the zoo and they've got giraffes in the background and there's elephants and the monkey cage. And it's just like this unbelievably grand estate. And they had found, um, a couple locations. It was a, it was a, the Huntington library, which is a kind of botanical garden in, in Pasadena, California that has these really beautiful gardens and it has a lot of depth and, you know, topiaries and, you know, and lots of, you know, it's, it's quite, quite exquisite. And then there's uh, and then a, and then an equally beautiful garden in a, in a mansion backyard in, in San Marino. And so the scene is combined by a couple of locations and, we looked at them and we said, well, even if we could light this, we don't have the resources to light it to the scope we want the audience to appreciate. Yeah. And, and more to the fact that the, the logistics of bringing in heavy equipment and lifts and cranes and, you know, putting lights on that in the pre-light and then having to shoot over the course of several nights because the scene is really long just seemed daunting. And, David said, well, let's just do the day for night thing. We can do day for night here. And we went back and we blocked it and we looked at the sun position. We thought it, you know, okay, well, it's got to stay backlit or side lit 90% of the time. So the sun is there. So we got to shoot this, high, this shot at this time. And we have to, you know, and we got to shoot that shot at this time. And, and the first day D and I and David kind of blocked it all out. And we had a whole, you know, a whole strategy of, of how to shoot it. And, um, and then I didn't sleep the night before because I was so nervous that it would be cloudy, you know, <laughs> like freaking out. In fact, it, there's, you know, the very beginning of the scene when she's sitting there and they open the bottle of gin and it was cloudy and it was sort of like one of those things where you're like, well, here we go. But, um, yeah, you know, was, I mean, there was a lot, we did a lot of testing and, and, uh, uh, in, in fact, the, when we first did the tests, uh, it, one of the, one of the side effects of shooting day for night is you have to add a tremendous amount of additional light to the actor's faces so that when you underexpose it, when you, you know, when you bring the exposure down in the, in the grade, uh, their faces feel lit still yeah. because otherwise their faces would go quite dark. So I was adding all this ridiculous amounts of light to, to, uh, Gary and Amanda's faces. And on the camera test, Gary came up to me and he said, man, I don't think I can do this. Like this, this is really hard. What do you mean? And, uh, well, it's just so much light. He was squinting. Oh, 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 I see. I see. Okay. You know, he was like, I can't, I don't know how I'm going to perform. And I said, oh God, I didn't even consider that. You know, it's like, of course the cinematographer didn't consider that the actor has to perform, you know, it's like, you feel like <laughs> such a jerk. But it looks and, good. Who cares? Well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah. But it's a visual medium, Gary. You know, yeah. it's like, uh, uh, we said, well, okay, well, what if we had some contact lenses made that were like, neutral density filters like sunglasses and gary said yeah maybe we can do that no so we way. made some so we made some contact lenses for gary and amanda so that they could be outside and they would they would their eyes would be wide open so they're you know it's like nd9 or whatever it was and they're, they're that's what they that's what we did wow um, so yeah it worked out really well um and they were able to perform and you know they were able to keep their eyes wide open as if as if it was nighttime what is uh, well First, just logistically, when you made that decision, I'm assuming you can't just get ND, you know, uh, um, contact lenses made in an hour, <laughs> or maybe I'm wrong. I mean, did that? Did you have to like stop product? Uh, I mean, how did you? How how much time between when you realized that that was going to happen to when you actually shot these scenes? Oh, it was months. Oh, it was really? months in advance. Yeah. We knew well in advance. Yeah, we shot some camera tests in pre-production, you know, during the prep. And, and one of the things we tested was that because we knew we were going to do it, you know, and I don't know when we shot that in December or something. So okay. it was, um, yeah, so we, we we probably figured that out in mid-September and then we were, you know, we didn't shoot it till, till December or whatever. And, uh, you know, they have, I mean, you can get you know, anything in Hollywood, you know, so you, <laughs> like you pick up the phone and there's somebody that makes it, I, you know, <laughs> I mean, it's not uncommon, by the way, you know, we change actors eye color all the time with colored contact lenses. Sure. So there are eyes, you know, these, these companies that make this stuff. Uh, I'm not sure that this was a, a request that they had ever had before, but they certainly now can do it. And it was, you know, it worked great. It's a really smart idea. And 
Yeah, you're right. I mean, you get eye color ones all the time, but I, I, I've never heard of an ND filter contact lens. I like it. Yeah. Well, they, they looked kind of ridiculous because then, it, you know, when you're out there during the day, you're looking at Gary and Amanda and they just have like these black, you know, <laughs> pupil. It was like, you know, but uh, yeah, it worked. Wow. And of course, you know, we're talking about the way the film looks from a lighting and a camera point of view. But I want to kind of wrap up our conversation in our last few minutes here talking about the production design, because so much is going into black and white beyond just the camera and the lighting and some of the filtration you talked about. But there must have been decisions in textures and clothing and the colors that are actually on set to give you the black and white um, kind of density that you're looking for. Can you talk to us about the way that you worked with your production designer uh, and how it differed in black and white than maybe traditionally in color? And this, sure. this came from a question just to kind of give credit. Aswin Lara on Instagram um, wanted to know what it's like to capture production design in black and white, you know, versus color. So I, I, I'd love to kind of round out our conversation here because I think it's a really important part of what makes all films work, but particularly this one. Um, it's just different. Black and white is just different. It requires yeah. a whole different set of materials. No, it certainly is. I mean, I look, I think cinematographers in almost every instance are over accredited for the way movies look. Mm. Uh, and, and production designers and costume designers, uh, deserve far more credit. They are, um, in, in many cases more responsible than we are. Um, you know, we probably have more to, more to do with the, with, you know, like I said earlier, you know, we have more in common with editors and they, they deserve more credit for the way the movie looks. But, um, but anyway, I, uh, you know, Don Burt is, um, is a, a virtuoso. I mean, he's incredible, and he's not 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 only in the fact that he has great ideas and and brilliant solutions, but he is also incredibly collaborative. And one you know one of the challenges we all knew, and Trish Somerville equally, she's a costume designer, and you know she's equally collaborative and and uh, an incredibly talented person. And and uh, you know one of the challenges the three of us discussed extensively in the beginning was well what are, what are these colors going to look like on camera and as as they were making those decisions they were very concerned that that those decisions would perpetuate and, and the results would be what they expected so you know don and i spent i spent a lot of time in his office and we were looking at tiles and we were looking at paint colors and trish was sending me fabrics and materials and you know it's in some cases the extras and some of the crowd scenes are wearing ridiculous colors specifically because they would render certain values. Um, you know, and, and they were, so we did a lot of testing. We did wardrobe tests and, and makeup tests. And, uh, and, and, uh, we shot a lot of stuff with our iPhone or I shot stills and brought them into the camera and desaturated, look them and looked at them. And then we, you know, the, the colors we liked, we brought in front of the, 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 motion picture camera and we looked at them again and then we went to the grade and did some test grades and looked at those values. So yeah, it was when we got pretty fractal with this, you know, it was yeah. not like, a, it wasn't something we didn't wing it for sure. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's a good thing. There's no color version of the movie because, you know, it would look like, um, you know, it looked like a Boz Lerman film, probably. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's just like color everywhere. <laughs> That'd be cool to see if you have, I mean, do you have like any shots behind the scenes shots from, in color that you can share that'd be fun you to put know, on the it's, site it's funny you know it's funny you say that actually there are not i you know and i don't know if that was intentional or we kind of everyone who was shooting behind the scenes pictures or just eat stuff on the right we just automatically shot everything i mean i didn't even think in color till i mean i didn't i didn't shot i i went back and uh well we shut down after uh we shut down well the, we finished the movie and then the you know the shutdown happened and then I didn't shoot again until I went to go do Fargo. And that was the first time I had shot color in like a year. Yeah. And it was so weird. It was like, I just had literally not thought about color. And I left Meg thinking I didn't, I was not interested in shooting color again. <laughs> I was like, man, I've been totally good. Just continuing to shoot black and white. Well, they could have given so, you the black and white episode of Fargo. <laughs> there was yeah, one right exactly. there for I you. <laughs> yeah. I know Well, Dana did beautiful work on it. So yes. it wasn't, you know, it was like, I, I, uh, yeah, I'm glad he did it. But, um, you know, it's, uh, I, yeah, I didn't, I, I, I don't know that there's any color 
shots behind the scenes. I, you know, so I certainly don't have any. I mean, all of my behind the scenes are black and white. For some, I guess it's just you know, I guess out of habit more than anything. Or, your... We're probably looking at something and you know wanting to see it in black and white. But well, the movie is called Mank. It's on Netflix right now. Of course, Eric. Messer Schmidt, ASC. Thank you so much for coming back on Go Creative Show. I mean, you, this is your third appearance in less than a year, so it's really getting ridiculous. I mean, we I, I don't know what's going on here. You've you're pumping out too much material. <laughs> I'm gonna start I'm gonna start sending you guys a time card, Ben. Seriously. <laughs> <How's that? laughs> well, of course, I want to thank you for coming on the show and best of luck with the film you're on now. Uh, of course we're gonna have you back for that one. You know that. Um, but just keep us posted on how it's going and, you know, take some behind the scenes photos because that stuff is always so valuable for us. And of course, all of you guys listening and asking questions on our social media platforms. Thank you so much for participating in the show. Eric, the film is amazing. You did an amazing job. Thank you so much. We'll see you next time. You're most welcome. Thanks, Ben. All right, I want to thank Eric Messerschmidt for coming back on Go Creative Show and talking to us all about Mank. Now, I hope you guys learned as much as I did in this episode, and I'm really hoping that I get to incorporate some black and white into projects that I do next year. So if there's an ad agency out there, any clients out there of mine that, you know, listen to the show, I want to do something black and white. I think it'd be a lot of fun. And if any of you guys are doing black and white work, please let us know in the show notes. Send us links. I think it'd be a really cool opportunity for, for me and the Go Creative Show listeners to check out that work and give some feedback. This is something I want to play with a little bit. I think black and white stuff is cool and I want to, I want to get into it more. So please let me know if you guys are working in it and what you have learned on your projects. I also want to thank our producer, Connor Crosby, for pulling this whole show together behind the scenes. You can find him at ignitionvisuals.com. And of course, Matt Russell and his team over at gainstructure.com for mixing, mastering, and making the show sound so good. I want to thank our sponsors, MZ Education for Creatives and Post Lab, Stress-Free Collaboration in Final Cut Pro and Premiere. And I also want to encourage you guys to check us out on Patreon. You can go to gocreativeshow.com forward slash join. Check out what we have to offer. And it's a great way to support the show, build the community, and really become part of the Go Creative Show. All there at gocreativeshow.com forward slash join. And of course, I want to thank our sponsors, MZ, Education for Creatives and Post Lab, Stress-Free Collaboration and Final Cut Pro in Premiere. Please support those that support us. And we'll see you next week on another episode of Go Creative Show, a podcast for filmmakers.